Hello everyone. Um, I've been really busy, so I haven't had time to post videos. Um, I'm up in Santa Barbara right now and I'm recording um, Drug Stories for Truckers Volume 1, my first album of stories, which is basically stories I tell on here, same style, but on steroids. It'll have sound effects, special appearances from people that you'll recognize, um, and it's a story that I've never told before. So it's brand new material. And I'm really excited about it. I stayed up all night last night working on it. I'm going to be recording tonight. It'll be out sometime in November. I'm thinking November 18th, maybe a little bit before that, but definitely before Thanksgiving. And I want to give some shout outs. Uh, Robin sent me a care package. And Robin, I appreciate that so much. So generous of you. Christian Ike, Sean Ryan, Samantha Annette, Tim Gago, Ricky Davis, and Stephen Pare. Did I do it right, Stephen? I've been practicing. <clears throat> What's really funny is I'm up here in Santa Barbara, right? And I was at the gas station. I saw Southsider, and he looked at me. He's like, hey, do you feel bomb right now, fool? And I was like, oh, my God. I, like, hurried out of the gas station, and I went to my chick, and I was like, we got to go. We got to go. We're going to get stabbed. And, yeah, I mean, Santa Barbara, they stab. They don't shoot. But it was someone recognized me. It is unsafe for me out there now. Um, anyway... Uh, you know, I'm self-financing and releasing this album. I got offered by like a legit hip-hop label to produce and distribute this album, but I decided to do it myself. So it costs money. One way that I'm raising money right now is I just ordered 800 sheets of blotter acid with the artwork that's in the thumbnail. Uh, it doesn't really have acid on it for all you narcs that are like, Oh, ibuprofen, you're going to go to prison. It's just perforated blotter art that you can frame. And I'm going to sell them for $40 a piece. They're signed by me. It'll say like one out of 100. It's a limited 800 uh, print edition. And that's it. I'll never print them again. And there's also going to be 10 artist proofs. So there's going to be so, like th this blotter. It's going to say Shaky Jake with this image. It's going to be signed and numbered by me. And then there's going to be 10 artist proofs that are exclusive. Um, I'm not going to sell them, but for the next 10 people that can send me $100 or more GoFundMe, that's what I'm using to finance the album, to get it mixed professionally, to get si uh, sound effects. You know, I want to be an independent artist, but I need help. So the next 10 people that send $100 or more in GoFundMe or on PayPal, I will send you a limited edition artist proof, and there will only be 10 of them in the world. Um... And it's really cool. Check out the art. And that art's done by my best friend, Jeff DeRose, who's an awesome artist. He's done a lot of, you know, pit, uh, different drawings and paintings of me and tributes to me throughout my life. He, he's got a very, very amazing body of work. And it's very blotter-esque. I'm very excited about that. So I didn't really have time to do a story tonight because I'm doing that. I, I'm going back to the studio. I'm going to go into this booth and I'm going to record it. I'm really trying to get this album just to be as as fire as possible for you guys. Funny and and horrifying all at once. Um, so what I decided to do tonight, just so I could post something, is I want to read you. I know a lot of you only know me from YouTube, but there's some of you that have been with me since Wasting Talent came out in 2014. Like legitimate fans of the book, or maybe you just recently read the book. Right now, I'm going to read a sample from my new novel, June Gloom, that comes out next year. This is going to be the first three chapters. Authors don't usually do that. You know, they're like, they keep it all secretive. And I think that it's cool that I'm going to be giving a sample to you guys. Um, I would love your feedback. And here we go. So this is going to be called June Gloom. And what it is, is it's a novel, so it's fictionalized, but... I feel like I'm more honest in my writing than I am in, you know, um, other mediums that I tell stories and in uh, other artistic outlets. Um, this story is going to be about three relationships I was in. Part, you know, the first section of the book is called fiance, the second part is called girlfriend, and the third part is called wife. Um, and they're three toxic relationships. I say it all the time: relationships seething with toxicity, and I am 
the unifying thread. I'm the sick one, but I attracted these other women and we had these codependent, tumultuous, horrible relationships. And a lot of it has to do with how prison PTSD affected me. Um, our vets come back with PTSD. And I think the way that we treat um, veterans in this country is deplorable. Um, you know, they fought and they risked their lives to protect our liberties and then we just abandon them. And that's bullshit. And it's a bullshit thing. Um, it's even worse for convicts because we're already demonized by society before we go to prison. We get out and oftentimes we have PTSD. I mean, I went in a soft, you know, um, kid from Santa Barbara, California, not the kind of place that gets you equipped to deal with the kind of violence that you see in a very rough and combative penitentiary. And I got out, I had PTSD, it affected my interpersonal relationships, and that's what this book's about. It's called June Gloom. Um, <clears throat> and without further ado, let's get into it. So this is the first three chapters, and this is the first section of the book called Fiancé, or a piece of it, the first three chapters of it. <clears throat> I smoke way too much. I need to stop. All right. You guys ready? Let's go. I'm in an on-again relationship with compulsion. Waking up before my fiancé, tiptoeing across our obnoxious hardwood floors to the guest bathroom so that I can jerk off to ass-licking lesbian porn on my iPhone. I sit on the toilet with my boxers around my ankles. There is no lotion and my panting is pained and harsh. I've mastered the timing so that when I know I'm about to finish, I spring up, spin around, one hand on the hip like a fencer, and come into the toilet bowl. Porn is outlawed in our totalitarian home. This has become a daily morning habit. The only important part of the process is wiping the toilet with Kleenex. I've made the mistake of leaving cum on there before. Sperm has proteins that will eventually harden and form into blot blotchy gray rashes on the toilet seat. I clear the browser history on my phone, and I tiptoe across the condo. The floors creak less on the way back. My side of the bed is still warm. Sometimes I even kiss my fiance until she wakes up for effect. That's the prologue. So this is the first chapter now. Prison handicaps you with unshakable paranoia. Theories. Number one, the violence you commit is more traumatizing than the violence you endure or are exposed to. It underscores the dangerous potentiality of any human being that's been pushed into a corner. Number two, the pseudo, very pseudo, law enforcement employs tyrannical tactics to marginalize and dehumanize inmates. They often lie or plant evidence in an effort to keep targeted individuals enslaved in the flytrap of the prison industrial complex. Number three, everything is easily weaponized. Metal cuts metal. You can make a knife out of a steel bunk bed frame with, a small, with small nail clippers. You can put a combination lock in a sock and bash someone's fucking skull apart. The chunks of hair will become soggy and stick to the swinging sock, modeling it with blood that's been blackened by its thickness. The first prison shank that was handed to me was called a friendly because it was made of plexiglass and wouldn't set off the metal detectors. The problem, explained to me, shit'll break when you try and whack someone with it, snap open right up in them. The friendlies are more for show. It's like whipping out a gun and knowing it doesn't have bullets. It still elicits fear. My friendly had a little hole in its handle that could be attached to a drawstring and tucked above my dick. That way, when cops patted me down, they wouldn't feel the knife because it had rested above my crotch. And although they can strip search you and often do, they won't touch your crotch. I knew you had to put in work to be recognized as a peckerwood. It's a racial thing. Being white doesn't mean you're automatically a peckerwood, but it's an obvious prerequisite. There has to be some sort of brutal affirmation to prove that you're worthy and solid. The volatility of the racial divide and combative social climate implores you to join this faction of loyal white soldiers for survival. <clears throat> they told me I had to stab someone and that the friendly wasn't going to work. I had to take him out with a knife designed for real damage called a bone crusher. 
I didn't know who it was going to be or the reason that I'd be stabbing him. The plan, the plan was that I'd be handed the piece before a volleyball game and then the first one to serve would be my target. Multiple times, they said, full fucking removal, dog. There's no way to pump yourself up to do something like this. The lead up feels breathless. It becomes almost impossible to complete coherent sentences. Every question gets answered in dreamy shakes and nods. They handed me the knife and told me I had to take out my celly. A guy I'd been living with for two years in a small cell. I could name all of the, his family members in the pictures that were taped to our walls. We sang along to embarrassing songs on the radio together. He was my best friend in prison. He was getting removed over a drug debt. Everyone knew the hit was going to happen. Other races had been notified as a courtesy. The eyes of convicts can be read like weather. You can see the storm of cautious and delayed glances towards the area where it's going to go down. He went to serve the ball, unaware that he'd be taken out by the person that he trusted the most. He never saw it coming. The knife was heavy like a flashlight. I thrust it into his lower back three times before it slipped out of my hand. It made holes in him. The handle jutted out of his leaking shirt and I stood frozen by the grotesque sight of it. He fell to his knees. He couldn't see that I was the one that had done it. I heard him try to cry out, but his voice was too raspy from gurgled blood. The plan was that I would hand off the knife after I hit him. They can't prosecute you if they don't recover the weapon. But I was paralyzed with nausea, and the throwaway guy had to rip the shank out himself. The volleyball court looked... The volleyball court sand looked like the shore of a shark attack. Streaks of blood that surrounded his shivering body. He finally saw me. The pain in his eyes further saddened by betrayal. And I learned that if I'm capable of doing that to someone I consider a brother, just to save myself, then the entire free world is comprised of unsuspecting corners that anyone can be backed in and out of. This is chapter two. Federal parole makes me go to court order therapy twice a month. It's total bullshit because there's zero therapeutic integrity. Anything I say to my therapist is going to be relayed back to my parole officer and the PO already dislikes me because my fiance is ridiculously attractive and despite my multiple felonies, I feel that I generally have a much better life than he does. So I lie. I don't tell my therapist, for instance, about trigger words. I'm obsessed with the idea of women I date cheating on me. I've been clean for nearly three years, but there seems to be some lingering psychosis from my heavy drug use, or PTSD from prison. I've always had paranoia surrounding relationships. I'm the kind of guy that would smoke crack or shoot meth and look through my girlfriend's phones instead of the much more common and practiced peeking out of blinds for phantom police shit that most developed crackheads do. The stimulant certainly amplified my obsessive paranoia fits, but they're even worse now that I'm sober. I'm cool in the beginning of relationships. I think my openness makes women feel comfortable being open with me. My personality attracts confessions about threesomes, prostitution, lesbian experience, is, etc. But as soon as I fall in love, I get jealous. I fall in love very easily, and then I become jealous of all the secrets they told me before I was in love. It's a vicious cycle. My fiance told me about a time she fucked a girl named Sarah. I was already falling in love with Casey back then, and I asked her, When you say fucked, you mean with a dildo? Like you fucked a chick wearing a fucking strap-on? Casey smiled until she realized that I was actually upset. I don't want to talk about it, she said. Come on, Casey, are you a dyke? You know that I'm not. Then why are you fucking a woman? Why would you fuck a woman if you aren't a fucking dyke? She just fingered me. I don't know. It was weird. I think there was a guy there. Oh my God, you're a disgusting whore. You were a worthless fucking cunt. You disgust me. She also told me that she used to get off to girl on girl porn. Her explanation was, I'm not attracted to chicks in real life. I had just got my heart broken, so I was pretty anti-dick at the time. God, why does it even matter? There would be innocuous slips that would reveal glimpses of her past sex life. I told her once that I wanted to lick her butt. Mmm, she said. I haven't done that since L.A. 
I now associate Los Angeles with Casey getting her asshole licked by another man. And then, after the early confessional stages of my relationships, I start prying, asking questions, gathering fodder for my obsessional ranges. Who licked your ass, Casey? A friend. So you just let your friends eat your ass out? You literally fucking disgust me. If someone likes or comments on a picture on Facebook, I ask if she slept with them, guy or girl. Oh my God, ew, no. At first she was honest and she'd admit about a person that she'd fucked. Now she just purses her lips, that delicate poker bluff reeking of guilt. She made the mistake of telling me the friends of mine that she had had sex with before we had met. So you sucked his dick? I don't know, probably. Probably? We were hanging out a lot back then. Yeah, I'm sure I did. If I sucked a dick, there's no way I'd forget if I did it or not. Casey laughed. <laughs> I'm sure you wouldn't. You think it's funny? That you had his filthy cum down your throat? You stupid, disgusting cunt. You seriously gross me the fuck out. The pornographic images of Casey loop in my mind with emotive trauma. She was living in Wilmington, North Carolina before we met, and it's where I believe Sarah fingered her. I can see her naked on some motel bed, sweaty mascara spilling from her eyes like busted pen ink. She has her mouth and legs spread wide open. Sarah has multiple fingers curled inside of Casey. There's a guy sitting on the foot of the bed, naked, boxers around his ankles. He masturbates, watching the girls and periodically grunting. In my mind, he is overweight, but still handsome. The word Sarah triggers me, even if it's oblique. We can be watching something on television and cuddling. I'm stroking Casey's hair and Sarah Jessica Parker comes on and then I push her off of me. What? What's wrong? You, you fucking disgust me. We can be driving, getting along fine and I see a North Carolina license plate and become silently apoplectic. It evokes the same dizzy fury of being cheated on. It be I become mean to Casey and she won't know why. Your tits are so saggy and disgusting. Sometimes I can't believe I'm stuck with you. Prison has made me fiercely afraid of being alone. I have separation anxiety and make Casey go with me everywhere. My therapist looks like she has multiple chins. They are separated by fans of flesh. When she turns red, which is often, the chins are consolidated into one large and rippled extension of her neck. Her office is in Sherman Oaks. It's the size of a walk-in closet and has a small bathroom attached. There have been multiple occasions that I've gone to my three o'clock appointment and there's been the indisputable odor of shit permeating the office. It makes the appointments awkward because she knows damn well that she blew the spot up and she has that stupid reddened smile. If I tell her the truth, the prison has turned me into a textbook psychopath with antisocial behavioral disorder who wages a barrage of verbal abuse on my fiance, she'll put it in the parole report and it will prevent me from discharging my supervision early. Although I really do want to change, I want to get the feds off of me as soon as possible. So we talk about my book mostly. I tell her how I got another blurb from a famous author, and now it's just a matter of time before I'm a famous author myself. She loves this. Casey loves this. The office stinks of my fat therapist shit. All right, this is chapter three. Casey is beyond beautiful. She's been like that her entire life. She modeled as a teenager and adorned the cover of several internationally renowned fashion magazines. Her dad was a severe alcoholic before she was born. He sobered up when she was three, but by then the wrecking wake of alcoholism had already swept his marriage completely away. The match between her parents was extremely odd. Casey's mother was a happy flower power chick. One of those people that annoy you with their simplistic obsessiveness. Her dad was boisterous, an authentic redneck from the countryside of Pennsylvania. Casey never told me, but I intuitively imagine it was the kind of thing where, she, where he was a buff barfly and she was some chirpy little slut. I'm sure she laughed at all his inappropriate jokes and fell for whatever sloppy lines he mumbled out. Her easiness essentially allowed a very toxic man into her life. They had two kids, Casey and her older brother, Todd. Although I'm convinced that Casey's memories are sanitized by love, she, call, she recalls the venomous abuse that her father would spew out. 
even after he had stopped drinking. Picking eight-year-old Casey up at soccer. You tell your cunt for a mother that she's worthless and that I hate her fucking disgusting guts. It would be cliche to point out the parallel between Casey's father and myself, but come on, the diction? It's uncanny. After the divorce, Casey's mom began working at the same grocery store she still manages 30 years later. Her father continued to work construction. They had split custody over the kids, and Casey told me with warmth that her dad went to all her soccer games and cheerleading practices, even on the days that weren't his days. Casey grew up in Virginia. The vibe there is preppy. It's like living in a fucking Abercrombie catalog. Although Casey wasn't rich, her starlit looks had always placed her at the top of the social stratosphere in school. In junior high, she met a girl named Allie, and they became best friends. Allie's parents were billionaires. Are you sure not millionaires, I asked? No, she said. Billionaires. Well, what do they do? I don't know. They own bridges or something. Casey and Allie were as close as sisters. Allie didn't care that Casey's family was divorced and poor. They were inseparable. Casey would vacation with them in private jets. They would go swimming in pools at lavish country clubs. Casey practically lived at Allie's parents' house. They would dance and sing in front of mirrors using shampoo bottles as their microphones. They stayed up late telling secrets in their pajamas. One time they kissed. One time they licked each other's pussies and liked it. They watched gross porn on the internet and chatted with boys via AOL Instant Messenger. They dominated high school. They were the prettiest and most popular girls in their class. They were cheerleaders and dated the best looking guys. They tried weed, learned that you never drink beer before hard liquor. They drove around in Allie's Lincoln Navigator shouting out the wrong lyrics to the Chronic 2001. Casey was homecoming queen. They practiced giving blowjobs on frozen hot dogs. Allie got into UCLA. And it had always been their dream to live in Cali, but Casey didn't even apply for college because she had no way of paying for it. The fact that they'd be torn apart disillusioned Casey. Money would finally separate them and they knew it. Casey would stay trapped in the cruel immobility of small town America. The summer after senior year was scorching hot. It was bittersweet for Casey because she knew that Allie was about to move out to LA. She cherished the time they spent drinking margaritas by the pool and talking about the future. They both had boyfriends that summer and would often hang out as a group. Casey's mom worked the late shift at the grocery store and her townhouse became the designated place for the teenagers to party at. It pissed Casey's older brother off because he was the one that had to placate the increasingly frustrated neighbors so that their mother wouldn't find out. Todd was popular in high school. He personified the classic straight shooter. The kind of preppy asshole that dresses like an NFL coach. He's a bank manager and stepdad now. It's perfect. Todd didn't drink or smoke, most likely because he was four years older than Casey and was actually able to remember the ravenous monster that would emerge every time their father came home drunk. Casey and Allie were transitioning into full-blown party girls. Todd would hear that they were all doing ecstasy somewhere and he would show up and make a huge scene. If he saw Casey drinking, he'd snatch the cup out of her hand and pour it out. Casey told me that the meanest thing that Todd ever said to her was that she had gotten more of her dad's genes than he had. Allie and Casey decided to throw a party the night before she left for college. They packed up their boyfriend, they, they picked up their boyfriends and went to grab a pack of clove cigarettes from the liquor store. They already had plenty of booze waiting for them back at the townhouse. Allie was actually completely sober when she hit a tree, head on, going 90 miles per hour. Casey was awoken to the charcoal haze of a burning engine. The remaining headlight was twitching, revealing the carnage in a terrifying wintry strobe. Allie dead, blood soaked and listless atop the deployed airbag. The boys dead in the back, paralyzed in a forward slump, suspended by their seatbelts, the eerie stillness and gray lighting of a vintage cautionary photograph. Casey went into shock and fell into a coma. Casey's mom and brother rushed to the hospital. The, do the doctors explained that Casey was on life support and there was a strong possibility that she wasn't going to make it. They howled and held on to each other desperately. Casey had serious head trauma. All of her teeth had been smashed out of her mouth. Her femur had been broken. A significant amount of her nose had been hacked off in the incident. Casey's father drove himself to the liquor store and righteously fucked off 15 years of sobriety. 
Innumerable friends, classmates, and family members kept a constant visiting rotation. Casey was never alone. Todd spent many nights sleeping in a chair next to her in the hospital bed. He would hold her hand and talk to her in, into the early morning, constantly dropping his voice to whisper rehearsed apologies. Casey was in a coma for 47 days. The walls in her hospital room became a colorful collage of drawings, greeting cards, and banners signed by everyone at her school. Beautiful bouquets of flowers seemed to bloom from every inch of the floor surrounding her bed. Casey had to undergo several reconstructive facial procedures and was given an off-white set of perfect teeth. The head trauma required her to relearn basic fun functions with physical therapists. Aside from a couple tiny scars above her lip and on the side of her nose, it's almost impossible to tell that her face had almost been completely destroyed. But Casey feels like she lost her beauty in the accident and has remained tragically insecure ever since. I lean over and give her scar kisses before we go to bed, before we go to bed every night. I gently kiss the top of her nose, its side, and above her lip. Don't ever forget how beautiful you are, I say. There was a profound paradoxical shift in the dynamics of Casey's family following the accident. Everyone blamed themselves and they took, they took it out on each other. Casey's father was back in the throes of blackout alcoholism, stopping by the townhouse to see Casey and harass her mom and call Todd simply the faggot. Allie's parents had been like a surrogate family to Casey, but they couldn't handle having her in their lives after they lost their real daughter. So they awarded Casey a huge settlement, a half million lump sum and 4,000 a month structured for the rest of her life. At 18 years old, Casey had more money than her mother, father, and brother combined. Casey was confronted with the actual pain of losing her friends. The buffer of shock had ebbed, and she was haunted by nightmarish flashbacks. Allie's beautiful eyes, wide and ghostly on her pallid face, the pennywell stench of spilled blood, screaming helplessly into the vastness of that spooky night. Casey started to exhibit textbook symptoms of survivor's guilt, insomnia, depression, suicidal ideation, and a general feeling of disconnect. She blames herself for her father's relapse. Can Casey's family took advantage of her vulnerability and they each systematically siphoned money from the settlement. Todd convinced her to give him a loan to finance some lame clothing company that flopped. Casey's mom begged her to pay off huge financial delinquencies that had been stacking up for years. Casey's father frequently called to ask her for small loans to pay his rent or pass due bar tabs. Casey had discovered her flair for photography while she was still in high school. She had won a couple of awards and had been accepted into a prestigious photography school in Santa Barbara, California. The school's tuition was inordinately expensive and she, had, she hadn't been able to afford it, but the settlement made attending possible. Casey moved out to Cali, realizing the dream she had once shared with her best friend, an obligatory tribute. This is what Allie would have wanted. Casey self-medicated with shopping and substance abuse. She became a free spirit and covered herself with expensive tattoos. She bought a new Audi, rented a condo with a panoramic ocean view, snorted fluffy lines of cocaine, and was coerced into reckless blunders on the stock market. She blew a half a million dollars in less than two years. Casey started sniffing Oxycontin and eventually got into heroin. She dropped out of school and lived off the monthly 4000 from her settlement. Casey's father destroyed his liver and had to get a transplant. Her brother never paid her back for the loan she had given him for the clothing company. She was working as a waitress when I met her. Palabra. <laughs>